Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello and welcome to The Money Factor. I'm Richard Nava, your host. Our topic today is evaluating job offers and to a certain extent negotiating salaries. Our guest is Dr. Thomas Denham. He's from Careers in Transition, LLC. I want to welcome you back, Tom. Thank you for having me back. It's great to be here again. We have covered, I know we have more work to do. I'm not trying to say we're done, but we have covered from networking and looking for a job and doing resumes and interviews and a lot of other things, uh, parts of the job process. And mm -hmm. today, it's kind of a nice day because we've been offered a job. Congratulations. And all we have That's to do awesome. is explain what we're going to do next. Uh, mm -hmm. Are we going to accept it and things like that. So, but before we get there, I was thinking, I put myself in, uh, in the place of the person who was just offered a job mm -hmm. and said, well, the economy and all these other things, I, I don't, we don't want it to seem too simple for people. So could you give us a little context mm -hmm. uh, so that we don't say that this is exactly what you mm -hmm. do in every situation? This is like trying to find a spouse. Mm. It's that complicated. And when you're trying to find a spouse, there are advantages, there's disadvantages to both. And this is one of the most complex things you can do is to marry an employer with an applicant and make it stick. So um, there are many, many things you have to consider that are maybe environmental factors. So for example, the state of the economy. Um, how's the economy doing right now? Not so good. Right. Um, where do you live? Do you live in a major metropolitan area where you might get multiple offers? Or do you live in a rural area where there are fewer opportunities? Right. There might only be one of these businesses in the whole county. That's right. Or within three counties. So you have to take that in consideration. You have to do an assessment of your finances. If you don't take this opportunity, how long could you hang out and survive before the next one came around? How long have you been job searching? Have you been job searching for three, six, nine months a year? The longer you job search, the longer that gap, the more questions and the less marketable. Um, you are. So what we do today is going to be in the context of these are all good things, this is the way to think about it, but situations may vary. Every situation is going to vary. There are some people that are going to hold out for their ideal job, there are going to be some people going to go for their backup, and then there's some people that are in survival mode. So every person is different. Some people want to only do work that they really, really want to do, and other people need to do any kind of work just to survive. Great. So let's assume now, for purposes of having an interview, that this is not the only possibility, uh, that it is a serious contemplation of the offer, mm -hmm. and move on from there. So what is the most important thing that one would think about in terms of whether to accept the job? I think some people get seduced by the third thing that's the most important, and that's salary and benefits. I think it is, uh, again, a seduction, a temptation to be lured in by the salary and benefits, when the two most important things are the job content and your boss. The job content is, are the duties and responsibilities. Would you really, on a day-to-day -day basis, really enjoy doing that job? And then, who is your boss? Is this person going to be an advocate, a mentor? Is this somebody that you can uh, grow to trust? Is this person going to nurture you and help you advance? Those are the two most important things. But we tend to go for salary and benefits. Those tend to be um, very poor long-term motivators. Well, let's talk more about the number one thing, the, the content of the job. Uh, I guess the opposite of one of the first things you said is not, not whether I like it or not, but can I do it? Now, maybe you already covered that. Or why would you be there? Well, there's a couple things. If they called you in for an interview, you must have done something right with your resume. Okay? 
uh, if you got an interview and then you had a second interview and you got an offer, they have faith that you can do the job. You may have your own doubts about it, but you should really never take a job that you could 100% do because it won't be a challenge. Interesting. If you have 60 to 80% of what they're looking for and they're willing to take a risk on you, that, that 20 or 40%, that's your growth. And that's been my experience in, in my career. And, and probably especially for the younger person. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If, if you're 65 and you know, that, More that mature, would be different. Yeah, right? that's, that's exactly right. So um, you, you, you want to find jobs that are going to challenge you. The other thing is, especially with jobs, what happens is we tend to idealize the job initially, and then we devalue it over time. So when you get a job offer, it could be a perfect job, great salary, great benefits, organizational flexibility, fantastic boss, 10 miles from your house, I'm going to meet new people, I'm going to be really challenged, learn all these new skills. That's what everyone thinks when they take a new job that sounds fantastic. But over time, we have a tendency to idealize then devalue it. So you ask that person 10 years from now, and they will give you a very different response. Or 10 weeks from now. Well, and that's the question people have to ask, and, and most people don't. And, and if I was uh, counseling a client, uh, as many times I do, I'll say, how long do you, are you going to be in this job for? And it's a question that they don't really ask. Well, I usually ask people when I'm interviewing them of how well, long that's they smart, see themselves in that job. That's right. That's a smart question. But in today's day and age, we're taking jobs. We're usually taking them for the wrong reasons just so we can survive. And then we wake up two years later and we say, I don't want to do this job. Well, why didn't you think about that ahead of time? I, I think you were also suggesting, you probably just said it, and uh, I, I want to go into it a little more depth. Sure that there's a tendency for people to, oh, you did say it, uh, when they idealize something, uh, now they, they kind of, it's like they wake up and they say, well, they're not perfect. Uh, they don't walk on water. Uh, right. They might get angry or they, you know, they were really happy yesterday, but they're not as happy today. Right. No employer is perfect. No boss is perfect. No coworkers are perfect. No organization is, is perfect. But you have to write down your list of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to every single option that you have so that you can take this decision making out of your head and write it down and be objective uh, when you're trying to uh, come to some conclusions about this. What can you tolerate? What can't you tolerate? OK, well, that sounds like we got our first thing. It's content. Think about what you're doing and all the, all the aspects of it that you gave, such as uh, is it challenging? Uh, is it interesting? Is what you want to do? Mm -hmm. Things like that. And you have to also think, where is this job going to take me? No job is permanent. So think about what stage are you in the career development process? Are you in the early stages, the middle stages, or toward the end of your career? How does this job fit into your career plans? And where can it take you long term? See, your, your career either hits a dead end like this, or the opportunities and jobs you take make it um, open up additional opportunities. Yeah, and I know some people in the past have looked at the large, really large company where you, you get your foot in the door. And in days gone by, when people stayed with the same company, they could think, well, I start as a junior salesman and I work up to senior vice president and who knows. Right. But as opposed to a small company where, yes, I start out as senior salesman, but I'm the only salesman, or there's only three. Right. You know, for my young, for my young um, professionals, I tell them it, when they get out of college, if you can stay in that job for one year, you should take that job. Okay. And many of them look at these job options and say, I don't want to do that because that's not what I want to do for the rest of my life. And they kind of have this perspective that when I get out of college, I'm going to get in this career, and I'm going to do it for the rest of my life. When, to a large extent, they know that that's not what they're going to do for the rest of their life, but they're taking this big leap. And I think most employers don't even expect that. I, they don't. The reason I ask is if I can't get one year out of someone, then I'm going to be retraining somebody, and they're that's, not really going to be fully functioning for six months anyway. That's exactly right. Yeah, you're right. So with the young people, uh, I will say, could you do this job for a year? And they say, yeah, I could do that job for a year. It becomes much more tolerable. And then I say, nine months into that, that first year, let's reevaluate. 
see where we're going. Maybe you want to take another job for two to three years. Then maybe you want to go to graduate school. Well, now you've got enough uh, education and experience to get into a good graduate school. When, you, when you're 55, you don't want to be taking a job for, for one year unless there's um, you know, exceptional circumstances and, right. you, and you must do that. Um, you want to be much more strategic. You want to be thinking, where can this job take me in the next two to three years, three to five years, five to seven years, five to ten years? And I don't recommend for most people to keep a job for more than ten years because you have a tendency, not always, but have a tendency to, to get stale in it. The second thing, you know, in a way it's obvious. Um, who wants to work for a total jerk? Mm -hmm. So the boss is second. Uh, but I think, for me, the, the follow-up question to that is, how can you tell? Uh, you know, the, Mr. Charm, when I went to the interview, right. I didn't know that there were all these other aspects to the personality. Well, it's, it's very much like dating. Everyone's on their best behavior when you're dating. And when you're thinking about a candidate or an employer, you don't have a lot of time to really get to know them. So maybe an interview is going to be an hour could be longer, could be a half day. You might come back for a half day of interviews. That's why for an employer, it's very important for multiple people to interview the candidate to get multiple perspectives. On Unfortunately, it. we can't interview multiple bosses from the same company. Unf but in today's Facebook, LinkedIn era, you might be able to do some research on them. And you can certainly uh, run it through your networks and say, I'm interviewing for this position. Do you know of this person? What could you tell me about them? Right. And, and that might be useful. But again, everyone's on their best behavior. And oftentimes, it's a bit of a gamble. You, may, you might find somebody who is fantastic, or you might find somebody who was, uh, uh, turned out to be a very different person. It'd be good if we had a few things to look for, although I, I would think that if we're really alert to trying to get some clues as to what kind of personality uh, the person has, we do better than if we weren't thinking about it. Yeah. Like, for example, if your boss has weapons, that's really a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, <Yeah>. not. <laughs> There's some very gentle hunters oh. out there. Well, you know, you can also tell by how they interview. Was it a stress interview? Did they make you feel relaxed? Mm. Was there a lot of pressure in it? Mm -hmm. What was that first reaction that you got? Usually the interview is over in the first two minutes. Did you feel a sense of, a sense of warmth? Did you feel comfortable? Um, would you like to spend more time with this person than you do with your family? Because oftentimes that is the case with work. We're spending a lot of time with our bosses and coworkers more than our families. So it seems like you really do get a lot of uh, information uh, the key is to be sensitive to it, and it's not just you. They probably are putting off vibes, and they might be coming off as brusque or mm -hmm. know-it-alls or whatever else. Right. Usually the first impression you get can be a lasting impression. So I, I can speed read people pretty well, and I can pick up whether they have negative energy or positive energy, how often they smile, do they laugh at some of my stupid jokes, do they have a good sense of humor, how do they interact with other people. You have to be very conscious of these things. And, and were they sincere? Were they, were they authentic and true? That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, the third thing you mentioned, and we only have three so far. You gave us three right off the bat. The salary. third one that you kind of said, okay, it's not first. Yeah, it's salary and benefits. Now, uh, I'm realistic. I mean, you do have to have a job to earn money so that you can pay your bills and your mortgage and not go bankrupt. Uh, like I said before, it's a very poor motivator. So when you get that, uh, don't expect five years from now that that is something that you're going to wake up every day and say, you know, I'm so glad I go to this job because I have money. Um, <laughs> it, it, you're going to wake up on Monday. Take that for granted. You, 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 you do. I mean, um, you know, you'll get your 3% raise or whatever. And I have clients that make six figures. And I said, if I give you $25,000 more, would you keep doing this job? And they say, you can give me $50,000 more to do this job. Because there's really a hole that's missing. And that is their daily duties and responsibilities uh, many times are meaningless. They, they don't find any kind of satisfaction out of it. And really, the key is that are you making a difference in the lives of people? Dr. King once said, um, life's most urgent question is what are you doing for others? And many people are coming to me in their 40s and 50s and often 60s, and they're saying, I want to... I don't, I don't, money is less important to me than making a difference. So when you're looking at a job, you have to think, is this in line with my core priorities? 
is this or an organization that um, I believe in? Now, I just gave a keynote address at Turning Stone Casino. I walked in the casino and I said I could never work for an organization like this because I just don't believe in gambling, certainly on that level. No, I don't either. So, um, you know, in that way. It's one, way to, it's one thing to buy a lottery ticket. It's uh, another thing to you know, create a, a, a massive organization. So my personal mission is not in line with that organization. And people have to, uh, to think about that. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point. It, it kind of adds a new dimension or another dimension to some of the things we've said. It's, um, the, maybe we can put it into the content one. I'm mm -hmm. not sure. Uh, but being proud of what you do is certainly maybe one way to look at it. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, you go to bed, are you satisfied with the work that you did today? Mm -hmm. Now, for me, I'm, I'm blessed because I know that each and every day I'm changing people's lives. And sometimes I have clients that are very upset about their job searches. and They, they cry in my office. They get upset. And uh, I'm trusted. And they feel like they can um, uh, let go of a lot of the anxiety. And when I go to bed at night, I'm thinking, wow, I was really there. I was fully present for somebody today, and hopefully I made a difference in their lives, and I get thank you notes and things like that. You know, it's nice to be paid, yeah. but uh, the thank you notes are, are sometimes equally rewarding. Well, I think we live in a world where, to us, it's whether we're achieving something, whether what we're doing is working out, and that's what gives us satisfaction. Um, I think that, you know, just buying things is ultimately not so satisfying, even though, you know, it's fun. Up to a point. Right. Uh, those things will eventually make you feel empty. I have too many clients that are prisoners to their possessions, that they would much rather sell all their possessions so that they could do what they love, but oftentimes they're trapped. Mm -hmm. Because of responsibilities or whatever. Responsibilities. They've bought a house that's too big. Now they've got to have a job that pays at that level. And with jobs at higher salaries, you're going to have more stress. So in a way, this can go back to the boss part. Because I think, to, to some extent, the corporate culture is reflected in that person. And of course, it's if, it's a, if it's a small company, then that is the corporate culture. And if uh, I once right. w walked into a business as a customer, and there were signs all over uh, about the, pushing the employees to win a trip to the Bahamas, and everybody's name was up on a board and how much they had sold. And I was thinking, I would never, certainly on no on my, uh, if I didn't have to, work in a place like that. And I would never buy from this company again. Right. Well, certainly as a librarian, you're, you're not motivated that way. You're motivated to serve. You, your, your job is to, it, your job is in the field of learning. You're here to help people learn, to be of service, and have people you know, discover uh, things about themselves or enrich themselves. And, and so what me makes me feel good is when somebody likes the library. Th that's right. Or they pick out a book, they come back, and they talk to you about it. Or you put on a program or a workshop, or you have some kind of book artistic discussion, a book or discussion or some kind of art display here. Your, your core values are in alignment with the mission of the organization. That's an organization that you're going to stay with for a long time. Right. So you have to really examine those things. And if it's not in alignment, you have to say, how long could I stay here for? If this is a job that I need to take to stabilize my situation, one, I'm going to save like a uh, like a, a, bee. Nobody, a bee, yeah, like nobody's business. <laughs> there you go. And two, I'm going to start immediately to have an exit strategy. Most people, when they take jobs, they don't have an exit strategy. And right. again, I'll ask them, you know, how long do you intend to be in this job? And, and usually I get blank stares. And the problem is then the resentment builds up, and then they get bored, and then they, you know, they're not challenged, and then they're trapped, and then they come to me, and they're at the boiling point, and they're just about ready to quit where they really needed to see me about two years ago. And you really need some time to help them work out a That's strategy. right. I mean, this, you know, trying to find another job, is it's not a drive-through career center that I offer. <laughs> right. I mean, it takes time. Yeah, would it's you like, like this one or this one? Right. You know, I can't say, would you like the $100,000, you know, right. job with fries? Right. Uh, you know, <laughs> and it's very much like losing weight. You can't lose 24 pounds in two weeks unless you're going to go on some kind of starvation diet, which would be almost, completely unhealthy yeah, for no, you. No, that would be hard. Uh, so, okay, there you, there what you else? What else? We got the big three. You know, other things, coworkers, very important. For many organizations, our coworkers become our family. We're spending an awful lot of time with these. So you want to like these people. Do you want to spend time with these people? 
Could you get along with them? And as a new person coming into an organization, you're basically coming into somebody's house and saying, I would like to have dinner with you every night. You know, yeah. I'm, you're joining a family. Uh, is the corporate culture similar or in alignment with your values? This is going to be a good fit. Uh, other things, typical work week. How many hours are there in a week, work week? Um, how much vacation time do you get? Um, if you have to pick your kid up at the bus stop, can, do you get to leave early one or two days a week? So is there flexibility? We, the, the, organ, the organizational flexibility. Um, Today there really ought to be people um, think that way. I think, isn't it, isn't it more likely today that a, an employer would say, yes, if you need to pick your kids up, we can work around that in the schedule? It depends. That's the not, answer. It's, so it's not Neverland yet. Uh, no, because uh, I am sure <laughs> that there's one viewer that says, my employer is very flexible. I have a great working relationship with my boss. There's never been a problem. And then there are going to be other viewers who are going to say, if my boss finds out that I have to go to a doctor's appointments, he hits the roof. Mm. So you're going to have that, that spectrum. And most people then are probably in the middle. Well, uh, one of the, uh, I'll, I'll be an advocate for entrepreneurship, which I think is the last bastion of job security in, a, in, a, in an era uh, of job insecurity, that I can't be fired as an entrepreneur. Um, I worked 13 hours yesterday, but today I'm picking my daughter up at the bus stop, and I get to choose when I want to work. It's very much like being retired. This is how I would envision retirement. Except for your 12-hour days. Uh, yes. Uh, well, the thing is, I don't, I don't get resentful working 12 or 13 hours because I'm building something for me. And, and you like it. And I, I absolutely love what I do. I'm making a difference. But um, I get to choose the hours that I want to do. Um, or as, as some people would say, I get to choose the 80 hours a week I want to work whenever I want to work it. <laughs> I like that. No, I don't work eight hours a week. <laughs> I work between 45 and 55 hours a week. And I know you do a lot of hiking. And I do hiking. I take my weekends off, things like family. that. So I think as we move forward, more and more people are going to go to this consulting, freelance, entrepreneurship option because it, uh, as much as it is very hard work, um, we're building something for ourselves. I can't be downsized, can't be laid off. I've got a great boss, great performance evaluation. Um, there are those ups and downs. You trade job security for the freedom and creativity, which we're so uh, desiring. And that's why when you retire, you're really trading up security and freedom, uh, tr security, so that you can get to do the things that you want to do. I'm just doing it a little bit earlier. That's good. It's fun. Uh, other things, location. Okay, good. I wanted to talk uh, about that. You know, how far away is this job? Uh, I just got off the phone with somebody who commutes two hours a day, one way. Obviously, they can't move. Uh, yeah, and so if you're in a rural area and you've got to go to a city to find the job, how much is that taking out of your day? And then how much is that creating stress? Well, you know, what, is it, what happens if gas goes to four? Five dollars a gallon. How is that going to impact you financially, and how does that play into your other goals and, and other life priorities? So, you know, in a way, this wouldn't be part of today's show if we looked at it as well. You knew where the job was before you did an interview, but on the other hand, if you, if you need to consider that as part of the package, is it is it worth driving 35 minutes as opposed to 20 minutes, and how much is that worth? Do I mind? Is it stressful? That kind of thing. Right. Um, I, I know somebody who um, lives up north, I won't say where, and she drives to work. It takes her about an hour and 15 minutes to get to work. That's two hours and uh, a half a day. That's two hours and a half a day on a good day. Mm, right. Now, That's there was, oh, there was a day it. where there were six inches of snow on the ground in the Adirondacks, and it took her over two hours to get home. And that was lucky, probably. It could be worse. <laughs> That's right. That's you know, it's a life-threatening <laughs> commute kind of thing. So uh, you've got to take those things into consideration. But again, when you're when you're living in a rural area, it, it can be more difficult than when you're living in, in an urban area. Now, this might be a tiny bit off topic, but uh, I once listened to someone talking about library jobs, and one of the main pieces of advice was. Here's a suitcase. Go where the job is. There is a, um, a theory or trend in many careers, and that is if you want to grow, you have to go. 
It even rhymes. <laughs> it, it, that's, that's, that's why I came up with it. Uh, I worked at Harvard University. I left. I went to work for Boston University. I left. I traveled back to the capital region. I worked for Union College. I left. I went to Siena. I left, started my own business. Every t time I've moved, I've grown. If I had stayed back in my first job, I would not have grown and matured enough. But every time we leave, we're going into uncharted territory and we're constantly thinking, I don't know if I can do this. You're taking a chance you're on You're taking yourself. a chance, you're gambling. <laughs> but what happens is when you overcome that fear and then you really focus on success and then you actually achieve it, you realize, wow, this, this is um, really where I ought to be. And, so, and, and I think when you look at it, there are professions where there just aren't enough steps or jobs locally. That's so, right. uh, I mean, the, the most, maybe it's almost a silly example, but the new chancellor of the university system, well, you don't, if, if she was going to leave right. here, where would she go? Texas, California? That, that's exactly right. If I was the director of the Career Center at Paul Smith's College in Saranac Lake in the Adirondacks, and I decide I want to go do something else, um, there might be another position on campus, but it might not be something that I would like to do, um, or I would be skilled at, or where I'd want to take my career. I got to right. leave. So those are the challenges. The other thing is, you know, that's fine when you're single, but when you've got a spouse and children, you have other people in tow. Then you've got to think about selling the house during the recession. And so there's all these these different variables. And that's why when we started the show. Uh, we talked about how complicated these things are. And just to throw in another one that I know that I've talked to a few people and they deal with this is, do you want to have a family? Mm -hmm. uh, this is especially true for females. Do you want to get to the top in your profession or do you want to have a family? And you could also say, can I do both? Mm -hmm. But some wiser people would say, chances are, if you try to do both, you won't achieve what you would have achieved if you're focused and you stick well, with the it, job. Well, it depends on um, how you define I want to do both. If you wanted to be the uh, director of the career center at uh, the Harvard Business School, you might be working 80 hours a week, which might impede you from having the quality time with your family. But if you were the director of the St. Rose Career Center, where there would be more work-life balance, you could have both. So but, really, but there's a different prestige level there, too. And it also depends on the profession. If it's something where you're going to forget things, if you have to take time off, it makes it more complicated. Right. That's right. Now, we've looked at the decision of whether we would like to go for the job. We put salary in third place, but we want to talk a little bit about negotiating. Mm -hmm. Because for some jobs, I guess the salary is the salary, and that's what it is. And right. well, I can't do a thing about it. I'm the interviewer, but that's the way it is. For, for, other ones, for, for some jobs, this is the salary. Take it or leave it. For other jobs, there and it depends on the size of the company. Uh, for many large organizations, there's going to be a salary grade, and they're probably going to hire you slightly below the midpoint of of that salary grade. So that's grade. pretty much what, what it's going to be. If if you've got a company that's got 15 employees and you're coming in with a, a great skill set and they really really want you and maybe they've courted you, uh, now you have some more flexibility. The person who states the salary first is the loser. Hmm. So that's why they are always trying to ask you what your salary range is first, or state your salary. And I see that in, in job ads. Right. State well, your salary well, requirements. Well, they, what they're really trying to, to ask is, are you within our salary range? So, for example, when I was at Siena, well, that's fair. It's fair. When I was at Siena, you couldn't get an interview until you told them what your range was or that fair. Because they don't want to interview somebody who wants $75,000 for a $40,000 job. It's, that's just not going to work. Or somebody coming in and saying, well, I know the poster said 60000 but I think maybe I could get more, so I'm going to try for it anyway. Well, it depends. Sometimes, um, like, for example, a college or university may have a 5 to 10% um, uh, leeway but if you're going for a job and it pays 60 and you ask for 100 you're not going to get it 
You're just not. Right. Uh, That's a pretty big chunk. Yeah, and you know, if you if you have a, a forty thousand dollar salary and you ask for forty three, that's a little bit different than asking for something um, exorbitant. So there's three things that you can do. When somebody gives you an offer, the, the very first thing that you do for all three of these things is you, say, you give thanks. You say, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. This is a great organization. Uh, I would love to join it, but this is a big um, decision for me and my family. So I'm wondering if I could have a little time to think about it. OK, so you don't have to don't have to accept on the spot. And you don't have to push them on the spot. No. See, what's happened is there's been a shift. When you're interviewing, you are trying to sell yourself. When you get the offer, they're, they're trying to sell you on the position. So um, when you have an offer, they have made an emotional investment in you. They don't want number two. They want you. And they're more likely to work with you. That's why you negotiate salary at the end of the process instead of the beginning. So if somebody goes to an interview and they say, um, you know, what, is this, what does this job pay? And that's one of the first things they say, that's where their focus is. They're not interested in the company. They're not interested in the job. They're just interested in the pay. And that's not somebody that you want in your organization for a long term. So the three things that you can do is you can accept, you can reject, or stall. I recommend the stall because uh, they're really putting you on the spot. They're saying, here's $50,000. We'd love to have you, jump, you know, uh, jump on board with us. What do you think? And the person says, wow, that's great. I'll take it. And then they go home and they say, oh, maybe, maybe I could have gotten more money. You only get more money if you ask for it. Now, it's unlikely that they're going to turn you down if you ask for a reasonable amount because they've made that emotional investment. But if you go in and say, you know, I, I, I see that you've given me this offer at 50 and I'm really looking for 125, <laughs> they're gonna, that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to laugh and laugh, say, yeah. you know, now, take a hike. Do you think 60 would be completely out of the question? Uh, it depends on the organization. It depends on the responsibilities of the job. The job. That's 20% this, more. Right. It, 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 the, the job, the salary is commensurate with the responsibilities. The more responsibilities, the higher the salary. So you might need a $75,000 job to maintain your lifestyle. They don't care about that. Right. That's not their problem. Yeah. I always find it funny when somebody tells me why I should hire them because they need something. Right. And see, um, yeah, the job search process is not about you. It's about what you can do for, for the organization. And that's what you get paid for. That, that's what you get paid. It's a transaction. It's right. like, I'm going to give you my time. You're going to give me a salary uh, in exchange for that. So you can accept, you can stall, or you can reject the offer. Uh, and either every time you're going to thank them, because this is a small community. Now, I guess it would vary. Of, uh, you say, could I have a little time? In one case, it could be. Uh, tomorrow morning. Yeah, I would say, um, since this is such a big decision for me, I would really like to think about this and get back to you. What would be a reasonable amount of time for me to get back to you? Very good. So you, you're throwing it back in their um, lap. I think so, people need to memorize what you just said. Right, or they can make an appointment. Got to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I've written about this, okay. so I'm happy to, uh, happy to share it. So, um, one employer might say, you know, really, we need to move on this very quickly. I'm wondering if you can get back to me uh, tomorrow by noon. And you might say, well, I I'm kind of tied up tomorrow. I'm wondering if I can get back to you the next day. So you're going to put, so they say here, and then you push it a little bit more. Uh, if somebody says, you know, could I have a weekend? Could I, could I have a week? If somebody has a week, could I get back to you in 10 days? Okay. This is going to stop you from being impulsive. Right. And get you to be more rational. So what I tell my clients is as soon as you get the job offer, tell them to stall and call me on the phone. Okay. Okay. And then I want you to think about it. I want you to go to, I want you to, go to sleep and think about it and see how you feel in the morning. Because the, the slower you, you move this process, because they've made an investment, the more you're going to make a more rational, informed decision. Now, you don't want to hold them off for three weeks or a month or, or things like that, because then they're well, going to go Well, because other candidates are they're gone. They're going to go to their number two. Well, they may not have number two. And I, I know that's a, a big problem for the employer. So you've raised the anti, anti that they have to uh, pay up in order to 
satisfied the fact that they've made that investment and that you might just push them beyond that. You have to be very careful. You, and, but you can pick up on verbal cues and nonverbal cues. Do they really want you? What's their tone and inflection in their voice? Mm -hmm. uh, are they really interested in you or do they look like they're going to uh, go right to the next go it was to a toss the, go up to the next person this one or that one we don't care black white whatever right usually when somebody threatens you like if you don't decide today we're yanking the offer that's probably not an organization I'd want to be with to begin with right it doesn't sound like an organization that if that's the way they're going to treat you even before you start on day 1 it's probably the way they're going to treat you once you start right it's unlikely that they're going to be warm and fuzzy after that so unless you're in this desperate situation probably better off going somewhere else? Uh, it depends. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Every answer is depends. Uh, how long have you been unemployed for? How much longer can you hold out? How much money do you have in savings? What's the unemployment rate? What's the unemployment rate? How many employers uh, are in your field? Um, how far out are they in terms of commuting? Would you be much better, I'm trying to help, I'm jumping in here. Would you be much better off taking the job and then taking another one later? It depends. <laughs> so we're talking in hypotheticals. It depends. Uh, you could take that job. The question again is, how long do you think you'll be in this job? If you're only going to be in the job six months, now you're going to have a spotty resume. You're going to be in, in danger of job hopping. Uh, that doesn't improve your, your reputation in the long run. In the long run. Um, if you took it for two to three years, maybe that would be okay. It all depends on the field. If you're a college president and you take a job and you're only there for two years, that's a recipe for you. You were a failure there. Right. They hated you. Right. Whereas another job, that could be like an eternity, right. two years. Right, right. No, that, I can relate. That's why sometimes advice is not a bad thing. Advice is a good thing, and I, I, um, people come to me and ask me lots of questions, and hopefully I give them good advice that, that sets them on the right path. But being rational and thinking very deliberately and carefully. Um, and I think a, what you threw in there is, was really clever, and that is how you say things. That's right. So. It, this is a very exciting process. When you get a, a job offer, you're relieved. You've worked so hard for this. But you, you just want to make sure... Um, you transition right, and that this is going to be a good for, fit for you, uh, both in the short term and the long term. I think we've got it. I think so. I hope our viewers uh, feel the same way, too. Me, too. <laughs> Thanks for coming back. Thank you for having me. We still have some work to do. OK. All right. Look Great. forward to it. And I want to thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's show, that you get something out of it, and that you have a great week. Take care. Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel.